The signal hypothesis explains how secretory, lysosomal, or other packaged or vesicular proteins are produced and processed. This slide begins a discussion of the first observations that led us to think there might be something different about the synthesis of secretory proteins compared to those which are kept inside the cells in the cytosol. Proteins like those of the glycolytic pathway, all of which are cytosolic enzymes that have to stay in the cytoplasm. Researchers were studying a cancer of a mouse, a myeloma, an immune system cell, and in this mouse, these cells produce only one of the polypeptide chains of an antibody of an immunoglobulin G molecule. They only produce one of the chains, and it was the smaller of them, called the IgG light chain. This IgG light chain was produced by cells like this in culture and secreted into the medium of that culture. So if you grew these cells after a period of time, you could just suck up some of the medium and look at the IgG light chain, which was the predominant secretory product of this cell. So if you added radioactive amino acids to this culture and waited a little bit, the radioactive amino acids would be incorporated into radioactive proteins, which would make the culture medium radioactive. So if you spun the cells in a centrifuge tube like this and threw away the cells, you would end up with the medium, which was radioactive because it had radioactive polypeptides, most of which are radioactive IgG molecules, or light chain of the IgG. With a little bit of protein purification, you end up with nothing but radioactive IgG light chain polypeptides. And if you were to put that into the slot or well of a polyacrylamide gel, you can separate the IgG molecule from any other remaining polypeptides by size, by molecular weight. So we're going to put that radioactive IgG preparation, partially if not fully purified, into lane 2, the second lane that the arrow is pointing to. We're going to put some molecular size markers into the first lane, and we're going to run the electrophoresis we're going to stain the gel for proteins. But now you see six uh, marker proteins of known molecular weight, and you see a protein from this medium also migrating there. We made a small amount radioactive to show that these cells are actually synthesizing IgG for a short time before we harvest the medium. However, the cells have been growing in the medium for quite a while and have produced a lot of IgG, which is enough to be picked up by the stain on the gel. But we also know that the small amount that was made in, say, a half an hour, an hour of culture, not shown here in terms of time, that small amount will have been made radioactive, and so we also have radioactive IgG, and it'll be obvious why we want that in a moment. In a separate experiment, we take cells from this culture and basically toss the medium, just to spin down the cells in the centrifuge tube, grind up the cells, shown here in a tissue grinder, and do an RNA purification. So you have a test tube at the end of this process, which contains pure RNA from these cells. This RNA contains mRNA for the IgG light chain. So you can add the ingredients that you need to do cell-free translation. What are those ingredients? Well, they'll include ribosomes, right? ATP to provide energy for translation. You remember the translation is energy intensive. And several other components that you will need in order to do cell-free protein synthesis. And what you're asking in this blue arrow is, given the machinery you need to make proteins, will that machinery take the RNA in this extract, specifically the messenger RNA, will the ribosomes bind to it, and will the ribosomes translate an IgG or any other polypeptide? In doing this, you're not going to get a lot of IgG. So here, we've added radioactive amino acids to ensure that when we do make a small amount of IgG, we'll be able to use the radioactivity of the newly made proteins to see the protein having been made. Okay, so now this tube at the bottom should contain radioactive IgG light chain and perhaps a few other proteins that might have been produced because of the different messenger RNAs present in this cell when the RNA was extracted. We're now going to purify the IgG that was made from any other proteins that might have been produced. So we just go through the motion of purifying it the way we did up on the top of this slide, except we're doing a sort of micro-scale purification because we know there's not a lot of it. What we should have in the test tube at the bottom right is a preparation of reasonably pure radioactive IgG light chain polypeptides made by in vitro or cell-free translation. And we will put that material on the third lane of this gel, which contains the markers and also a radioactive IgG light chain polypeptide made by living cells. We'll run the gel, 
We'll go ahead and stain it. After staining it, we will see the markers. We will see the IgG from the culture because the cells have been sitting in that culture for a long time and have made plenty of IgG by staining. When we stain the gel, we won't see anything on the third lane because we didn't make enough IgG to really pick up with stain. So how do we detect IgG that would have been made during the self-retranslation process, the small amount that would have been made radioactive? Well, you put a piece of film on top of the gel, and you'll be able to expose for a period of time, develop the film, develop the autoradiograph, and wherever there was radioactivity, you will see a band or a spot representing where the radioactive proteins went. You will see that there are two bands. The marker lane doesn't show up on the autoradiograph because it wasn't radioactive to begin with. The IgG produced by the cells, which we then purified from the culture medium, was made radioactive for a brief time before we extracted the medium, and so it is also radioactive, and the radioactive spot forms at the same position as the stain for the IgG in the second lane. Should be no surprise there. The IgG made by cell-free translation is also showing up. When this experiment was done, the expectation was that the second band should be right next to the first one, meaning it should be the same size as the material made by the cells. And as you can see, it represents a spot that on the gel was migrating more slowly. We didn't get as far from the well as the secreted IgG produced by the culture. On these gels, faster moving molecules are smaller. Slower moving molecules are larger. So the results suggest that the secreted immunoglobulin light chain produced by this mouse myeloma cell is smaller than the IgG light chain that we purified from cell-free translation product by using the extracted messenger RNA in a cell-free protein synthesizing system. How might we interpret this? There's clearly a precursor IgG light chain that is produced during translation by the ribosome reading a message. Somehow, before that precursor IgG leaves the cell, it is cleaved to a smaller polypeptide. So that's the interpretation of the actual observed results. Going a step further, the investigators who did this work came up with a signal hypothesis. They suggested that the extra length of the IgG light chain could be due, or the extra size, could be due to additional amino acids somewhere in this polypeptide that function as a traffic signal. They suggested the extra length might be necessary to direct a ribosome with a growing polypeptide to find the rough endoplasmic reticulum where secreted proteins are packaged. And another component of this hypothesis then is since what is secreted is actually smaller than what you make in a cell-free protein synthesizing system, there must be an enzyme in the rough endoplasmic reticulum that cuts off the signal peptide or the signal sequence, this extra group of amino acids, so that what's left is an IgG light chain of the correct size once it is secreted.